Gandhi had resolved to wait half a year after his arrest in August 1942, before undertaking a fast in protest against his incarceration. On New Year's Eve of 1942, he wrote to Linlithgow, I have given myself six months. The period is drawing to a close, so is my patience. The law of Satyagraha as I know it prescribes a remedy in such moments of trial. It is crucify the flesh by fasting. That same law forbids its use except as a last resort. I do not want to use it if I can avoid it. Convince me of my error or errors and I shall make ample amends. On January 29, 1943, Gandhi wrote, If then I cannot get soothing balm for my pain, I must commence after the early morning breakfast on the 9th of February a fast for 21 days. When Viceroy Linlithgow informed his council of Gandhi's decision, they were very reluctant to risk the possibility of his dying in detention, unanimously proposing his immediate release. Viceroy did not feel justified in opposing the unanimous view of his own council, so he agreed that it would be safer to release Gandhi while he fasted than to be held responsible for what might be the fatal outcome. When Churchill heard of Linlithgow's decision, he was outraged, calling an emergency cabinet meeting a day before Gandhi's fast was to begin. Secretary of State Amory reported how quickly Churchill worked himself into one of his states of indignation over India and how this our hour of triumph everywhere in the world was not the time to cringe before a miserable little old man who had always been our enemy. Attlee alone made a very mild attempt to suggest that imprisoning or releasing Gandhi was not the same thing as dealing with an ordinary criminal in this country. Since Gandhi's fast to capacity allowed him to drink water and fruit juice, the Viceroy estimated he might survive for three weeks. But Governor of Bombay Lumley had learned that Gandhi would only take enough fruit juice to make the water he drank palatable, giving him little nutritive value. Weighing 109 pounds when he began his fast, Gandhi lost 18 pounds after his 21-day ordeal, yet survived, despite Surgeon General Candy's fear that he could not endure so severe a strain to his system for more than 12 days. Churchill and Linlithgow cynically suspected that Gandhi's Indian doctor added glucose to his water, but no evidence of this was ever discovered. In a private letter to Linlithgow on the eve of Gandhi's fast, Amory confessed that, there really is something in Gandhi's plea that Indians can only agree once we are out of the way. Linlithgow was rather shocked by Amory's daring and, to his mind, impractical suggestion. Most prominent Indian leaders, except for Jinnah, agreed to attend a non-party conference in Delhi to discuss how best to deal with the situation arising out of Gandhi's fast. Jinnah, who had never gone to jail, insisted that it was a matter for Hindu leaders alone to consider. Bombay's shipping magnate, Sir Kawasji Jehangir, then a member of the Viceroy's National Defense Council, severely criticized Gandhi's action, and his Parsi colleague on the Executive Council, Sir Homi Modi, told Linlithgow in confidence that he thought the Mahatma's demise would be a real contribution to Indian politics, or so the Viceroy reported. A few days later, however, Modi joined Dr. M. S. Aini and N. R. Sarkar in tendering his resignation from the Viceroy's Council when he learned of a serious deterioration in Gandhi's health. Modi was anxious not to be blamed by his colleagues if, indeed, Gandhi did die, and they then learned what he had said. Fears for Gandhi's health reverberated from Washington. In response to Ambassador Phillips' question about what would happen to India if indeed Gandhi died in detention, Linlithgow predicted six months' unpleasantness steadily declining in volume. After it was over, India would be far more reliable as a base for operations. Moreover, the prospect of a settlement would be greatly enhanced by the disappearance of Gandhi. Amory agreed and hoped, as Linlithgow requested, that Churchill could raise the question of the possibly positive impact of Gandhi's death directly with Roosevelt. Amory learned that Roosevelt had told Secretary of State Cordell Hull, our biggest desire is not to see the fellow Gandhi die in prison. Linlithgow wrote to Churchill of Gandhi as the world's most successful humbug. I do not think Gandhi has the slightest intention of dying, and I imagine he has been eating better meals than I have for the last week. Churchill wired Field Marshal Smuts on February 26th. What fools we should have been to flinch before all this bluff and sob stuff. To Linlithgow, Churchill wrote, 
It seemed almost certain that the old rascal, Gandhi, will emerge all the better for his so-called fast. Gandhi broke his three-week fast on March 3, 1943, sipping six ounces of orange juice. It is difficult to say what permanent damage may have been caused by the fast, Surgeon General Candy recorded in his note of Gandhi's fast two days later. From the speed with which uremic symptoms appeared and from the knowledge of old standing high blood pressure, there is reason to believe that the kidneys were below par before the fast began. Mr. Gandhi also suffers from arteriosclerosis, a concomitant of high blood pressure. This report added fuel to the chorus of cries to the Viceroy to release his most famous and frail prisoner. A strictly secret report to the Viceroy on the proceedings of the Muslim League's April 1943 meetings in Delhi emphasized the unusual luster that had been added to Jinnah's leadership since the recent death of Punjab's Muslim premier, Sir Sikandar Hyatt Khan, and the deterioration of the Congress party, all of whose top leaders were in prison. Linlithgow and Amory both felt particularly nervous that if Gandhi was allowed to meet with Jinnah again during the war, they might well reach agreement and launch a joint movement to accelerate the demise of the Raj. In his opening speech to his league on April 24th, Jinnah unexpectedly announced, Nobody would welcome it more than myself if Mr. Gandhi is even now really willing to come to a settlement on the basis of Pakistan. It will be the greatest day both for the Hindus and the Muslims. Why does he not write to me direct? Who is there that can prevent him from doing so? Gandhi read this speech in one of the newspapers he was permitted, and he immediately wrote to, Dear Kaide Azem, I welcome your invitation. I suggest our meeting face to face. The Mahatma's letter, however, was ordered by Churchill never to be delivered. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and social media and support at Patreon. Thank you.